good morning, third grade. This is Father Don, and I received the list of your questions that you would like answered. And so let's just dive right into them. What does the white thing on your collar stand for? Well, this white thing is just a little plastic tab anymore. Um, this comes from maybe 150 years ago, so this is not an old tradition in the church at all. This was a way for the clergy of England, which would have been Anglican or Episcopalian, to set themselves apart in public so that people knew they were clergy. In the clothes they wore, then they needed something to cincture it up at top. And so they often would have a clasp and the stuff like that, but they did it to set themselves apart. Before that, the Catholic priests would also often wear something called cassocks. They're big, long, white gown, uh, black gowns with a whole bunch of buttons running down the center type thing. Occasionally you may see one of those, but that's how Catholic priests were normally seen. So about 150 years ago, maybe, they started adopting this white collar. And eventually the Roman Catholic Church sort of started doing it throughout the world. However, when I go to Latin America, most of them don't wear their clerics. You know, they will occasionally, but most don't. So it depends on the country whether or not you wear them or not. Um, but here in the United States, most priests would wear this. Who knows, in a hundred years from now, that may totally change as well the dress of priests. Um, how often do you celebrate Mass? So normally most priests don't work on Mondays. Then Tuesday through Friday, there's a daily Mass of some type. And then most will celebrate one Mass on Saturday and two on Sunday. Normally three for the people. Now during this coronavirus shutdown, I have to do a lot of private Masses. Um, which definitely are not as much fun or anything like that as the public Masses. So four weekday, three on the weekend is seven. And then you might have one special one at the nursing home, a funeral, a wedding, something like that during a week as well. Have you read the whole Bible? Well, for this, I want to turn to an expert on the Bible, Flat Matt. So Flat Matt is going to talk about the Bible. Hey, friends. What's the question again, Father Don? The question is, have you read the whole Bible? Oh, the whole Bible, that's a lot to read. Well, when I was around, when I was following Jesus, we didn't have the Bible as we know it today. We just had the Old Testament with Genesis and Exodus and the Psalms and the stories of the kings and the people of Israel. But we knew that very well. We were taught in, in the Jewish faith, we were taught the old scriptures very well. So we knew the Psalms, we knew the scriptures, we knew the stories, and we knew the prophecies of the coming Messiah. So as we follow Jesus and learn more about him and what he told us and how his life unfolded, we started to see that this might be the anointed one, the one who has prophesied throughout all of history up until this point. And he changed the world. And I wrote everything I remembered in the Gospel of Matthew, which is now part of the New Testament. But when I was walking the earth, we didn't have the rest of the New Testament. So I can't say that I've read the whole Bible understood because actually Saint Matt was one of the martyrs and some of the books of the Bible written by other the apostles he may not have ever seen. Now I personally self have I read the whole Bible? Probably. There are the few parts I know that I haven't totally gone through in depth. As an example the book of Numbers. Why is it called the book of Numbers? Because it just has numbers and numbers and numbers of things and it's like Quite honestly, it gets a little boring. Um, it was boring for me way back then, too. <laughs> understood. So there's a few things. Certainly all of the New Testament, the vast majority of the Old Testament, but there may be a few Old Testament parts that I haven't really spent much time with. Thank you, Flat Matt. Anytime. Okay. How can God take care of all of us at one time? Okay. This is a very difficult question. It goes to the nature of God, okay? 
as physical people, we are physical beings, we have bodies, don't we? We can generally only be in one place at one time, right? God does not have a body. God is spirit. Therefore, God is timeless. Time only occurs because you have material stuff. You measure time by um, something moving from some place to the next. Here's this. Now in time, I moved it over here. Something like that. So we measure time by physical movement. Actually, technically in science now, it's a wavelength of a cesium decay particle, I believe. That's actually how those things are measured, but it still is matter. God does not have matter. God exists outside of time. God is the ground of what is called all being. So therefore, God, not only can God be everywhere at once, but he can be in every time period at once as well. So it's even a bigger mystery. Everywhere, every time, any place, even before there was stuff, God existed and is able to be present to everything. And that is because God's nature of who God is is different than ours. Very tough question. I probably confused you totally. Give it a few more years and it might make you more sense. Next question. What is the hardest part about being a priest and how do you know what to say? How do you know what to say? I'll do that first. You really need to be a person of prayer if you're going to be a priest. You need the Holy Spirit to speak through you to the people. And a lot of times we don't know what we should say to the people. We don't know how to fix all problems. We don't know how to make things right. Sometimes I don't even know what people are looking for. But if you rely on the Holy Spirit, the Spirit can inspire you to say things that comfort people. See, we don't become priests just by our knowledge. We do study. But the more important thing is to be a person of prayer and to be open to the Holy Spirit and where it takes you. So the hardest part about being priest Many priests love people and want to fix all their problems. That's a problem for priests because we can't fix everyone's problems. Not every problem is fixable. Sometimes people don't do the right things to help them fix their problems and you feel very sad for them when they struggle so much in life. So I think it's the same as being a parent. If a parent has a child that's struggling a lot in life, it really hurts them. They wish they knew what they could do to make things better, but they can't. And that is a hard part about being a parent. When you cannot help people that you love. I would argue for being a priest, it's the same thing. That you want so many good things for so many people. And you just struggle to help them to get up. So... How do you run the church? Um, you should run the church in the same way you run a family. We are the people of God. It should be run with love. And at the beginning, when people are young, you do need to tell them what to do. So like when you were three, four years old, your parents had to tell you, Look both ways before you cross the street. Hold my hand. Don't do this. Don't touch the fire. It's hot. They had to tell you and direct you to do many things. Okay? And they did that out of love to care for you. But as people get older, how you lead them changes. So you guys in third grade... I don't have to tell you, don't touch the fire, it's hot. You already know that, right? I might remind you, keep your distance. Sparks might jump from the fire and burn you. 
There's more to learn as you go along, right? You can't just stay with fire, don't touch. Um, well, you'll never be a welder if you don't learn. You've got to be close to it and things like that. So the direction changes. And then as people become adults, you don't really have to tell them what to do. You get them the materials they need. In order to be a good leader, you need to understand what the people under you need, try to provide those resources to them, and also understand that they know more than you do. Technically, all the teachers are under me, right? I'm sort of in charge of everything. They are far better teachers than I ever could be. They understand the kids far more than I do. They know teaching methods far better than I do. So they're smarter than me and all those things. My job isn't to be as smart as they are in their area. My job as a leader is to give them what they need to help provide the resources for what they need in order to teach. So when you think about leadership, how do you run a church? How do you think about it? How do you run, let's say, a sports team? Does the coach, does he do all the work? No. He helps train the ones who don't understand a skill and tries to give it to them. And then for the ones who have the skill, he encourages them to be leaders and to help others. Often a coach, one of the main things a coach has to do, line up the practice field, line up the games to play, line up transportation to get everybody there, things like that. You realize those don't take genius things in their sport. They're coordinating things to make it happen. So think about that as leadership. Don't think about running everything. Think about building up, teaching the younger ones, empowering the others, and getting the resources the people need in order to do their jobs. Huh? Oh, and I already did the other one. So if you have more questions that you want to do, that'd be wonderful. So let's just end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, help us to always keep learning, even when we can't gather to learn. May we always be curious about our world, and ask questions that help us to learn. May we make connections with everything in our life so that we grow as a whole person, united in your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. You guys have a wonderful day.